So I'm going to talk about management of relapsed refractory CLL. I made some cases, and I think it probably would be easy. There will be some overlap of what uh, slides some uh, fellows presented, but that is mainly to explain the, the efficacy of different drugs uh, if they are efficacious and upfront. It's likely to be efficacious even in the relapse setting. So let's go. Um, so I'll be doing clinical case discussions and the relapse factory. So this is case one. Then a 54-year-old male, known diabetic, type 2 diabetes mellitus. In March 2014, his CLL rise stage 2, spleen 2 centimeter below costal margin, WBC was 131, platelet 219, hemoglobin 11.9. So by definition, I think it was rise stage 2. I did not feel that he required therapy at this time. But by December 2014, his count jumped to 270,000, hemoglobin went down to 9.2, and platelets went to 129,000. Spleen was palpable, about 5 centimeter below costal margin. The liver was also palpable. Bone marrow was diffuse infiltration, no chromosomal abnormality, other than 13Q deletion. So I decided to treat him at that time. I gave him FCR, about six cycles. There was hematological response. But spleen, spleen was still palpable, palpable at two centimeters below coastal margin. Complete blood count was normal. So, what do you do then? Just observe the patient, I guess. Would you consider this as a failure at this time or to therapy? Don't not ignore the the last one. But the, at this time, if you have given six cycles, would you consider giving anything else at this stage? Because CL is an incurable disease. I mean, he may be not in CR, but he has responded to some extent. Uh, would you have considered at this stage, when the spleen was still palpable at 2 centimeters below costal margin, but the CBC was normal, would you have considered a targeted therapy at that time? Yeah. So would you consider going to a second line at this stage? Anyway, three months later, I <laughs> He was found to have hemoglobin 11.2, platelets of 60,000, WBC was 8.5 with 67% lymphocytes in the, in, the, in the counts. Bone marrow at that time showed diffuse infiltration. So CLL not in CR post FCR. So I evaluated him uh, in June 2015. His white cell count was 29, platelets 37, hemoglobin 114. And again, in November 2015, his white cell count was 68, platelet 74, hemoglobin. I don't know what happened in between, whether he went back to the referring hospital or not, but usually I would have given him something over here. Uh, I don't know how to explain this. I think he went back to where he was referred from, and I saw him back in November. At the same time, again, he had 13Q deletion. Clinically, he was stable, generally asymptomatic. What therapy would you select at this stage? Any choices? This is open forum discussion, so I don't have to answer the questions or discuss later on even. So any 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 choice would you consider? He's failed FCR, so obviously you're not going to give FCR again within like a span of 12 months. It's probably not going to work. Any anything else would you consider at this stage? Another chemo. If he's not responded to FCR up front when he still has the disease and within three months he goes back into anemia thrombosis. I think bendamustine rituximab, you, will not be have, you won't be able to get much mileage out of it. So you have to do some, give something I think that would benefit this patient in form of uh, getting into some sort of remission. Probably not even in remission. So if somebody goes to like five or ten years and relapses, you can make a case. They're still young. You can give them the same, and they may go into. Although, even then, the, the next progression would be shorter than the first uh, progression. This is well known. So, uh, reflux refractory. One patient not in CR post FCR. Hematological parameters slowly worsening. When to treat? 
uh, with the second line therapy, um, what regimen to use, what is the prognosis, chemotherapy versus brutal tyrosine can inhibitor, PR3 can inhibitors versus BCL2 inhibitor, or take the patient to allergenic stem cell transplantation, he's 52, uh, you still have to treat him with something to get him into remission, even if you consider L transplant that somebody who relapsed within such a short period of uh, very aggressive, well-known therapy, he probably may not stay in remission for a long, long period of time. So the resonant uh, follow-up, uh, this uh, ESCO 2019, this is a courtesy of our sponsor, I got it in a slight form, with intention to treat uh, analysis. There is certainly a significant advantage in uh, previously treated CLL, SLL patients on the brutal progression was significantly longer. So it is a very effective drug. If you look at this graph, even uh, and compare it to other graphs of chemoimmunotherapy, certainly it's better. And if you look at the progression-free survival, this, uh, certainly for patients uh, who are on a brutinib uh, is much better. The genomic high-risk population also with deletion 17P, P53 mutation, and deletion 11Q or unmutated. <coughs> for all these high-risk groups, of course, brutinib was much better than uh, ofotumumab. Or uh, you could say that, I mean, ofotumumab is really out of practice looks like because not a very effective drug apparently uh, but certainly there is a drug that has shown a significant advantage and if you have used if you had used another chemotherapy as Dr. Uh, um, just said uh, they are just said that the next progression would be even shorter or half of them will not respond and even if they respond to something the, the time of the progression for cell would be very very short so I think it's reasonable given this data to look at the uh, at the outcome on patients and select a therapy. Uh, again, uh, in by deletion 17P or 53 or uh, IGHP mutation, I think uh, pa all patients do very well. Uh, when you look at the ibrutinib, uh, the long term, apparently it looks like there are all kind of uh, side effects can be there, but as the time goes by, there seems to be some tolerability for these patients who are okay, except the hypertension as was mentioned by Firas also just recently, that, that is something that needs to be taken care of. There's some pneumonia still lingering on even after six years, although much higher in the first few years. And then the fatigue and arthralgia probably decrease as the time goes by. Infections is a challenging thing. I think the they significant number do develop uh, infections, and one has to be careful about those things uh, and how to deal with them, and I'm sure uh, there will be more discussion on this one. So conclusion from that trial, the efficacy of in a relapsed refractory patient for, uh, for a targeted therapy, the six-year follow-up, the robust and durable efficacy with extended treatment in patients with relapsed refractory CLL has been shown. Improvement in outcome is evident in all risk groups, including patients with high risks. And the clinical and genomic features and the safety analysis established to continue treatment with albutrin can be delivered long-term to provide patients, and certainly you have to, uh, uh, it's challenging to really, because these are new drugs, and you will encounter more side effect that you may not have encountered because previous chemotherapies were six months or whatever, and now these are continuing, some of these therapies are ongoing for years and years, and patients tend to respond. And so when they come with infections, you have to worry whether these are secondary to ibrutinib or whether this is secondary to the disease or what. So relapsed refractive fail, failing progressive, uh, this is the one that I presented uh, off first line. So would you consider another chemotherapy? Of course, we discussed that it probably would not be a choice. Mutation status was unknown, known 17P of normality. <coughs> uh, progressive disease had in 12 to 18 months started a in 2016. So I started him on a brutinib. It initially was not available. You, know, you had to fill out these forms. And he's currently in CR without any significant side effects. So it's almost three years now. Uh, he's okay. He has not developed any significant side effects, no hypertension and no <coughs> pneumonias or atrial fibrillation. I don't do ECGs, but I do have a clinical examination I do if they are not symptomatic and if their pulse is okay. So he's doing okay. He's young, so you know, a lot of, so he didn't have any, he did not have any comorbidity. So it seems that even the younger patients, for relapsed refractory patients, certainly and even for newer, younger patients, I think as uh, Riyadh said, 
sometimes there is a choice. The patient may not make a choice. Some or or as the time goes on, this may come into a first line therapy upfront even for other patients. Okay. So would you consider a combination of novel agents? If he is relapsed within such a short period of time, would you consider for this relapsed refractory or refractory patient a combination of novel agents? Would you just give a brutinib? Would you add venetoclax to it also for more efficacy or this is the brutal plus brutoclax in, re in relapsed refractory patients. Uh, this was from 2018 ASH, uh, a then plus brutoclax for same length of time as needed to achieve MRD negativity or brutal monotherapy has continued and brutoclax for less than 24 months. Primary endpoint eradication MRD and key secondary endpoints after six months eradication negative MRD. After six months of combined ibrutinib plus venetoclax, uh, this combination, uh, if you think the patient is young, maybe he will go into a better CR or a longer progression-free survival. You got undetectable MRD in 39% patients in peripheral blood and 24% in the bone marrow. And after 12 months of combined therapy, uh, all patients that responded by the criteria of the IWCLL, the complete remission of CRCRI was about 40, 58%, and 87% had no more had no morphological evidence here in the bone marrow biopsy. The MRD4 or MRD was achieved in 58% patients in peripheral blood and 41% in the bone marrow. There seemed to be a continuous improvement in the depth of MRD reduction with 41% in MRD4 and 29% having undetectable. So a good number of patients did actually somebody who had relapsed in refractory previously treated patients. Uh, the benefit is quite evident. And uh, when you look at this, 49 patients, 12 months plus for, for both the combination and the follow-ups at, at, at four months, again, 54%. All 50 patients are progression-free and alive. This is on the follow-up of the trial. Uh, this was this follow-up was presented in the IWCLL 2019 in September. Case number two, although it's not a treatment naive, but I thought I'll just show it to you know, make it a bit more flavorful. I have a 31-year-old female. She's referred for elevated WBC, but normal physical examination. So I thought, because Firas had already presented naive, so let's see what people want to do with this patient. White blood cell count is 40,000, platelets are 350, hemoglobin is 106, but she also has an iron deficiency anemia. So there is an iron deficiency also. This is not truly uh, 106 because of the CLL. Uh, CT scan was done uh, for whatever reason, subcentimetric lymph nodes in the abdomen. Chromosome showed trisomy 12. IGH mutation is unmutated. Rise stage is zero. When and what treatment would you select if required? After the first talk, you should be able to give me an answer. What would you like to treat this patient? Anyone, any? Hmm? OK, that's number one. Wait and see. At this stage, it doesn't require therapy. If this patient progresses later on, maybe in a year, two years, three years, would you consider an FCR? Would you consider a BR? Would you consider a targeted therapy? It's unmutated. No, FCR may not be a good choice. Okay. So case number three, there's a treatment naive CLL, suboptimal response to community. Again, the same thing that the first one had. I gave this patient, this is a 47-year-old. Uh, female, rise stage 3, Benet C in August 2018. Chromosomes fish was normal, CD38 negative, IGH status is not known. At that time, we didn't have the IGH status, we didn't send it, and I don't have the answer to this one. I've sent it now. I don't know what the answer. I gave this patient FCR, first cycle, the Weissel count was 400,000 to 300,000. So she would drop down to 200 or 150. By the time she, come with, she came for a second cycle, she was again at 300 or 400. So I gave a second cycle, thought, you know, the patients can respond. So she didn't respond. Again, by the time she comes back in three weeks of two, three to four weeks for the next cycle, her white count went up again. Persistent splenomegaly W has increased to more than 200,000 post cycle, uh, cycle number two FCR. So the counts would go down and would recur back again. Uh, to more than 200,000. <coughs> so I changed the treatment to ibrutinib, 420 milligram daily. 
and she has achieved the CR, WB is 13, hemoglobin last one is 119, platelets 189, and she's tolerating well so far, has no complications. So this is what I did on this patient. Same as the last one, but that patient is three year follow up. This patient is recent, but has no other complication, but did respond. So the moment I shifted to Ibrutinib somehow, uh, the response was excellent. Although I don't know whether if I had continued FCR, maybe she would have gone into a further reduction in the counts, but after two one, but she, every time she would go come up with the count, so I thought maybe she's not, she's a poor responder. So I switched. Would somebody have, would have continued FCR? Riyadh, would you have continued? Some people would give four cycles and then review. I decided to because I saw that every time she came, she came back with a rapid rise in the count, and the spleen was almost the same. There was no change. So. You mean uh, before Ibrutinib? Yes. Uh, I can't remember. I don't think I did. Well, to such a short time, I thought probably wouldn't change. She had trisomy 12, so after two cycles or two or th three months with no response and the spleen the same, I didn't elect to do it. Although the question is, if the 17P or was not picked up by fish, would you do a mutation analysis of TPP53? Uh, we didn't send it. Yeah. Ideally, you can do it, no. but do you need it? No. Yeah. Because you already decided how to treat. Hmm. Okay, so it will not change your mind yeah. that you're going for it. Absolutely. For the purpose of documentation, I thought, but, so but I didn't do it. Ideally, yeah. if you're in an hmm. academic center and you want to know, then ideally you should do it. Okay. So line study, I just thought maybe, although uh, I think uh, Faraz just talked about this one um, in older patients. So the advantage is there, uh, certainly in all uh, arms of uh, ibrutinib and ibrutinib-rituximab, maybe not difference. So there is certainly, this can be used uh, because this was for the patients who had uh, showed older patients untreated. So you can translate sometimes these kind of uh, uh, benefit to a patient that you want to use. So this phase actually also though showed uh, reduximab does not promote with the brutinib, but it does show that brutinib is a very active drug and certainly better for untreated patients and older, so hopefully the same thing would have been, uh, was already shown in a younger patient who did not respond to FCR. Again, the ECOG 1912 for previously untreated CLN less than 17, Again, this trial also showed uh, uh, benefit for patients who were started on uh, abrutinib. Reported safety for all treatment related to neutropenia certainly uh, was uh, less, but if you look at the com infectious complications, were less overall, but this is a time-limited therapy as compared to looks like a lifelong or as, soon, or as long as they don't progress, you continue that therapy. So the smaller numbers over here uh, may not, uh, it may look okay, but as the time passes by, these are going to stay there while this is only for the purpose of six months. Some of these patients do have some infectious complications later on also. So in subgroup analysis again, it showed uh, a superior, uh, uh, superiority to FCR independent of age, sex, performance, status, disease, status, present absence of 11Q23 was superior to FCR for IGH, IGHV unmutated patients, but not IGHV mutated patients. So that's why, as uh, Riyadh had also mentioned, and Firas also mentioned, that if you have a younger patient who have mutated, it's just some of these patients can go into like 10 years of, I have a patient more than 10 years post FCR still in remission. So there are patients who you, for, for practical purpose, are considered as cured with leading a normal life. Grade three to four treatment related adverse events were observed in 58% of the patients with ibrutinib rituximab and 70% with uh, treated patients. Uh, but this is, again, as I said, this is, uh, can be misleading sometimes because the time limited. It's six months versus continuation of therapy for ibrutinib. So cumulative may eventually, over the years, may actually be more. So this is a, it's a challenging to really um, go through this medication, take your patient through uh, trying to avoid complications and trying to, uh, what you call, anticipate the complications and treat them at the proper time. 
So combination, of course, was superior. Uh, now, so selection of the patients, exposure to Britain for prolonged periods of time, assessment of clinical molecular and genetic factors essential for before initiating therapy, and mutation status has to be routine evaluation now. Uh, in our center, we are stand, sending it outside and we are getting it, but still, I think as an academic center, we should all have this test available as a routine test before you initiate therapy. Case number four. Now this is a patient I saw in 2000, so obviously I don't have much of the medication that I used. He's a nasopharyngeal mass and bone marrow was positive. I gave him six cycles, he achieved a CR. In 2012 he presented with a progressive disease with nasopharyngeal mass again. So it was resected, revealing again CLSL with a small focus of rectal transformation. So there was a small focus, but the rest of the scans, everything was negative. So this was the only area, and they resected it. And then the pathology, they said that there is a small focus of rectal transformation, like a diffuse loss cell lymphoma over there. So I decided to give him RCHOP at that time, gave him four cycles. And because it was a limited area, I offered him involved field radiation therapy, but he refused. He didn't want to have the radiation therapy. And he didn't want any further chemotherapy. Four cycle was for him was enough, and he didn't want to. So I told him, if you don't want involved field, I can go up for two more cycles to complete a six cycle therapy, but he refused. So then again in 2014, this is, uh, so this one was quite a long time. And but because of the rectus transformation, I had given him job. In 2014, he presented with left facial palsy, left mastoid mass, PET scan was positive, bone marrow was positive, obviously for CLSLL, chromosome with trisomy 12 and 13 Q abnormality along with anemia and thrombocytopenia. So what do you want to do with this at that time? Do you have any, would you consider any other therapy? Would you consider that he had received FCR in the past? At this time, although bone marrow was done, we didn't do any uh, left mastoid mass. I can't remember there was any biopsy done. If it was done, this probably was CLL. So there was no rectus transformation. Would you consider uh, the first response to FCR was excellent? Consider FCR again here? Or? 60 plus, about 65 or 67 years old, 67, 68 years old. Yeah. Maybe close to 70 now. Hmm? Hmm. Okay. Yeah, he's older now. I mean, when he started, he was late, but now I think he's about 67 or 70, I'm not sure. But he's close to 70 years of age. His son is a physician, so a lot of times he do a lot of scans in between and he talks to me. And is being followed in the mom also, uh, this patient. Uh, so both follow. So relapsed effects failed multiple lines of chemotherapy, uh, progressive disease in February 2015. I started on the brutinib. He achieved a complete remission, and PET was negative. His uh, facial palsy eventually resolved. He's much better now. Uh, no specific side effects of brutinib, no hypertension, no arrhythmias. And I plan is to continue brutinib. Would you con how long are you going to con would you continue? Would you have added uh, rituximab with it or? Hmm? No side effects. Yeah. Would you have uh, considered rituximab when I started him on birthday? Would somebody consider rituximab at that time also? Okay. So on a follow up, he has a mild. Normocytic normochromic anemia, rule out ibrutin related rule out MDS because he got a lot of therapy in the past. He got FCR and then he got CHOP also. So I did all the tests. He doesn't have hemolytic anemia. His reticulocyte count was okay. Vitamin B12 folate, all normal. Stool for a cold blood was because the patient is a ibrutinib. Sometimes you can have subclinical blood, GI blood loss and uh, they can develop some sort of uh, anemia. Iron profile was low iron, normal ferritin, possible mild GI blood loss secondary to brutinib as a possibility. Uh, I think he got a colonoscopy that was okay. Bone marrow was done, there was no myelodysplastic syndrome. There was no dysplasia there. His hemoglobin stable, slightly low, so I assume that he, although the colonoscopy was okay, there was no overt bleeding, but some of these patients can have some, some GI blood loss. And this is well known with the brutinib, so one has to be careful. Um, 
CT chest was done, had including sinuses because of the nasal mass, uh, which was positive for CL in the past, and PET scan on November 2018 is no evidence of disease. So an excellent response to Britannip, uh, especially for somebody who does not have too much of side effects. So follow up in July 2019 this year, scan demonstrated numerous small, mildly enlarged lymph nodes in the neck, chest, and abdomen that shows FDG ability similar to the blood pool and compatible with patients known diagnosis. I don't know what really come up with this. No evidence of intense hypermetabolic activity above liver in lymph nodes would suggest a rectus transformation. I would have considered this as a possibly a CR still. I don't, I don't think there's any disease recurrence or anything, nothing else. So I continued on a brutinib. And he's doing very well, except that he developed a pneumonia in the local hospital and was not getting better. So they did a scan again. So PET scan demonstrates numerous small, mildly enlarged lymph nodes that check the same thing, blood pool. Interval increase in the previously demonstrated lung interstitial thickening currently involving the right middle lobe and both lower lobes, likely related to chemotherapy induced interstitial pneumonitis, possibly related to brutinib. Now, Brutinib, I don't know if any one of us is going to talk about the toxicities. Uh, you are going to talk? Okay. So I think it's, it's not too much. I think it was from what I remember, uh, Riyadh, you can, when in your talk, maybe uh, delve on it. It was like 3%, but I guess this was a pneumonitis. He was not getting better. And uh, I could not see him. So at the local hospital, they put him in the venetoclax. From a limited supply, they said, do you have venetoclax? <laughs> so I said, We'll see what if he comes to me. So would you consider changing therapy at this stage? Would you consider venetoclax at this stage? Or do you think pneumonitis, significant that he's symptomatic, would change the therapy? So Riyadh will talk more about this, I think, in his uh, toxicities profile. Um, I thought maybe I'll give you some idea about the venet for the efficacy of, uh, of venetoclax plus rituximab. Uh, with a meaningful improvement in the overall survival as compared to chemotherapy. So obviously this choice was not available for him or would not be given to him because he's already gone through it. The chemotherapy, he has failed the brutinib, or I shouldn't say failed, but he, you know, he developed complication from the brutinib. So, and that is an efficacious drug as compared to the historical uh, chemotherapy things. Um, there is uh, mentioned somewhere over here, I think, uh, pneumonia, when 10, 8%, 5.2%, actually less as compared to, oh, but again, this is a short term and this is a long term. So in summary, uh, targeted therapies have markedly improved response and survival of relapsed refractory patients with CLL, including those with high risk disease. Uh, chemoimmunotherapy may no longer have a role in the relapse setting. Once they relapse, until, unless there is a contraindication for the BTK or BCR receptor or BCL2 receptor inhibitors, I think uh, these drugs and the, most of the trials have shown that chemoimmunotherapy in a relapse setting is inferior uh, to these targeted therapies. And I think if the therapy is easily tolerable, one should select a targeted therapy because most of the trials, almost all of the trials, have shown a benefit of targeted therapy in the relapse setting. Uh, the challenge is now is how to best sequence the treatments, and I'm sure the next talk will talk about the sequence of treatments also. Uh, there's numerous ongoing trials exploring combination of novel agents, and we looked at the, one of the novel agents of combination of uh, venetoclax and the brutinib. Uh, managing side effects in continuous change therapy is challenging. So this is something that has to be taken care of. The drug is effective, and almost all patients, and CLL is a disease incurable, and uh, after getting the initial chemotherapy or chemo they are going to relapse, and if they're not candidates for chemoimmunotherapy, especially if they're not relapsing after 10 or 12 years, one would choose uh, a, a treatment that is oral, that is can be taken easily. So you have to be aware that as the time passes by, you have to manage these patients from their side effects and toxicity also. Thank you very much.